come stay a while and listen as we spin you a story of the most bizarre variety. I am your co-host, Jason, and I'm joined, as always, as usual, with Will over here. I like that you melded secretly what we're going to be talking about in the second half of today's episode. Very yeah. nice. Do you like that? Yeah. Good morning. Good meet. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Good <laughs> afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's. Oh, I'm so tired, man. So fucking tired. Yeah, you have social obligations. You're a social butterfly. It's not just that too. It's just work's been very busy, and also the fact that because of all that, I've been pushing back my watch times for all the anime we're going to be talking about today. So I only just finished. Uh, I'd say like. Four hours ago, some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Kind of like me with Fruits Basket. Exactly, right? Oh, man. But the show must go on, right? So, ah, welcome back. We're back at it again for some more good anime palette. Good shit. All right. So, um, what we've been watching and reading, actually, Will and I have watched separately um, the same shows, which is some of the seasonal shows that are airing right now. But I would like to talk about a manga, actually. And this brings back to our seasonal discussion uh, for fall, which was, I think, episode 19. Yep. So, Tesla Note is probably one of the worst rated shows currently, definitely this season, but also just in general. I think it's like 3.8 something. Which is like a horrendous score. I think like when it comes to like the worst anime of all time, like, whenever you look at the mal scores, like, the mal rankings, a lot of them are like either one shots or like really short OVAs. Like for example, like Mars of Destruction is only like one or two episodes. I think I, one. I know it's one. Yeah, so like that kind of counts, but also doesn't count. Um, and then before, right? I think the lowest was X Arm, mm-hmm. which is like a two point something. Yes. And then now Tesla Note, which a lot of people dubbed X Arm Season 2, which I also agree with that. Hard not to connect the two. Right. So I decided uh, to read Tesla Note, the manga. It came out uh, published by Kodansha, and it just came out, I think, a, like a week ago, two weeks ago. Right. So it must look like trash as well, right? Because of how bad the anime was. So here's the thing, Will. Oh, shit. The manga actually looks really good. Wait, really? It's really good. Yes. You're not joking, right? No, you know, I, he's, you not, know he's not joking because I've also seen some of it too. The art is actually fantastic in 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 Tesla Note, uh, the manga, and uh, the story beats are almost exactly identical. But the fact that the art and everything is drawn in such a way that it's coherent. Some of the Clothing choices and styles of the characters oh, yeah. are extremely different from the anime. So I'm not going to... Uh, this is not a spoiler. There is a, a male and a female main character. The male main character is a secret agent. And in Tesla Note, the anime, he dresses up like... Like some Shinjuku Shibuya... Like hip-hop boy. Yeah. Street fashion, which is like, okay. But then in the manga, he dresses up in a suit like like any other normal secret agent person would. And uh, the girl also just looks normal. Everything looks normal. But in the manga as well, there have these two-page spreads of certain scenes. And it looks fantastic. And the details is so... Like, they're so detailed. Some of them are, like, Blame-esque. Like, I'm not going to say that it's the exact same quality because Blame looks fucking amazing. But you could see, like, in comparison to the anime, that a lot of effort... A lot more effort was put into the manga. That So that's why it's super perplexing to me that the manga is actually decent comparatively to the anime adaptation, which is utter trash. So, Tesla Note, the manga, you're okay. Tesla Note, the anime, go fuck right off. Yeah. I, I <laughs> Well, if you just want to have like a good, bad time, you should still check out Tesla Note. Yeah. So, there's that. All right. I'm done with the manga. I mean, I've also read a lot, but we're not going to talk about. Yeah, so we're moving on of uh, you know from one seasonal of the manga adaptation variety into the and- actual anime seasonals. This is this is this is going to be some good shit because we talked a lot about. I'd say like we we covered like 
75 to 80% of what we wanted to talk about, but because of release schedules, we weren't able to discuss these two shows specifically. And we mentioned it towards the end that, oh, we will probably revisit, uh, not revisit, we will visit these two shows, see it, and then comment on it. And visit, we did. Yeah. Holy fuck. Comey can't communicate, and they call it ranking of kings rather than king's ranking. Yeah, it's because like Osama ranking, Osama being king, they for like direct translation, king's right. ranking, but really like for it, English grammatical sense, it is ranking of kings. Yep, and it also makes sense because of the story as well, which we'll explain later. So Will and I watched both of these uh, series. Will caught up all three episodes of Ranking of Kings. I only watched two of the three episodes, but I have watched all two episodes of Comey Can't Communicate on Netflix and. Will probably has watched both episodes, right? Yep. So just to give like a quick update in terms of where these two shows stand, uh, so Osama Ranking or King of Ranking, Kings of, uh, Ranking of Kings, uh, released on October fifteenth, as uh, for uh, Comey can communicate. Uh, it had different release schedules. I think it was like first like Japanese broadcast, international broadcast, and then Netflix. Anyways, on Netflix right now, it's got two episodes. Comey can communicate, holding a very very solid eight point four seven. And then Ranking of Kings with a monstrous 8.66. That's crazy. Osama Summer Ranking right now, the way that it's literally the ranking, no pun intended, uh, it is, oh no, 8.68 now. It's ranked 54 overall. As of right now, it is the number one ranked anime of this season. So it superseded. Mashoko Tensei, Jobless Reincarnation Season 2. And Part 2 of uh, 86. That's correct. So it is it even beat uh, Kimitsu no Yaiba Mugen Train. So that's crazy to me. Right. But before we go into Ranking of Kings, I think we should spend some time talking about Komi Can't Communicate. So I read Komi Can't Communicate. Obviously, Komi Can't Communicate is based on a manga. And I really, really like the manga. I read it before there was an anime adaptation. And... Uh, if you uh, listen back, I forgot which episode when they announced that they were doing an anime adaptation. I uh, kind of passed out. I mean, it, it's incredible that like for a manga that is not only scored in eight point two nine, which is enough to put it in the top three hundred. That's already really good. But in terms of popularity, it's twenty seventh overall. Yeah, dude, that's crazy. And the fact that years and years and years people have been clamoring for an anime adaptation. In fact, a lot of those rankings in Japan of which series should be anim- animated, Comey Can't Communicate is either on the list or on the top of that list. So here we are now. It's it's out officially, produced by OLM. What do you think, Will? Comey Can't Communicate is incredible. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's really, really good. I mean, of course, like, there's always going to be some areas where I'm like, eh, they could have improved on that, or mm, that didn't really hit as good as I thought it would. But overall... Just watching it from beginning to end, like at least watching the two episodes that are on Netflix, it's a really beautiful show. It's I, really pretty. The sound could, eh, or actually, the lack of sound. I think like what's really what's really really good is the fact that I mean let's, let's just talk about a bit more about what the show is. Sure, uh, the show is about a high school. I think Itai High School or something. Itai Private High School, and so it's, the, a, it's a it's it's essentially a prep school. And in this uh, high school, there are an assortment of characters. One of these characters is Kyoko Komi. Shoko Komi, I think. Ah, Shoko Komi. And she has a speech issue. She has a communication disorder. But she can't really convey that to other people or can't really say that because she has a communication disorder. And because she is goddamn gorgeous, she is worshipped by literally everyone. Yeah, like, as soon as she steps into the gates of uh, Itan, uh, Itan, the the private school, everyone is fawning over her. Everyone is just literally, like, at her feet, just praying and worshipping her, all except for one person. Well, I mean, she, he also because he, worships well, he, her. But not in the sense that he's, like, oh, my God, this is literally a literal god as I have to, like, dedicate my life to her. It's more just he's also a very clueless kind of... MC, right? Because he's trying to live his own story arc as well. Tadano, so he is kind of your typical, not very, uh, doesn't have a lot of self confidence, not very outspoken, not very popular, not very good looking. No, as 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 someone someone would put it, 
uh, exceptional qualities. He's just very average. Yet, he sits next to Comey, and long story short, uh, they have an interaction, and then from that point onwards, it spirals into this huge mission that Tadano and Comey tries to fulfill. And uh, I don't... Should we even mention what that is? I think we should. At the very least, it it, it, it exemplifies what makes the show beautiful because of the fact that for Comey... The, the, the central theme, the central like plot here, which is exactly what the title says, is the fact that Comey can't communicate. She finds it very difficult to speak to people. She finds it very difficult to you know, keep herself together in social situations. And then whenever she does need to socially interact with someone, when people think that she's coming off as cool or like evasive or like you know, looking down on you or just like just not with anything to do with you, internally she's actually panicking. She doesn't know how to control herself. She doesn't know that she wants to say something, but she can't. And therefore, like she's always like kind of beating herself up as of, of why can't I talk to anyone? Right. I why think, can't I actually you know interact with my peers? I think the narrator for both episodes in the beginning mentioned that just because you're not very good at communicating does not mean you do not want to communicate. And I think that point is a uh, very uh, poignant, really. So the other funny thing is that. It's not just Comey that has, I guess, issues with certain things. And it turns out that a lot of the class or a lot of the school students all have their own special issue. And uh, they get revealed over time. So I think that this adaptation, first of all, it looks amazing. I can't believe it is made by OLM. Not to diss OLM. In general, OLM shows just look fine. They are very respectable, but they're not outstanding. But Comey is very, very gorgeous and outstanding, I would say. You know what else that uh, OLM, OLM did recently? I know. Right? Yes. Like, you, again, they're known to do more sort of like bigger adaptations. Like, they've done like many adaptations stuff, like the Pokemon series, even some of the movies. They've done other things like, um, actually, no, just lots and lots and lots of Pokemon, like Sun and Moon, uh, Best Wishes, all the different movies. There's, there's like 15, 16 movies. But, oh, in by April, the way, Will is talking about Odd Taxi, basically. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Oh, sorry. Thanks for ruining it. Sorry, I thought you were just going to. Fucking dick. Comey right. can't communicate is wonderful. Okay, we're just gonna move 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 away from, you know, Jason taking away my shine. But one thing that I really did like about Comey, and it's not even that significant, is that whenever Comey tries to say something, and then she has that little panic moment before she's like very cool. Her eyes kind of like a little bit like slanted, stares at you. It's like really looking down on you. But then that pop moment, and all of a sudden her eyes become really fucking big like you you you've played um Final Fantasy 6 before right a long time ago yes right so whenever her eyes pop up it reminds me of how the FF6 sprites look and that was just like that's one thing i really 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 like you for also forget about the cat ears that i didn't care about that at all dude the cat ears are adorable that's just all you man i mean i'm not i, I didn't think they were that cute okay it's the eyes i like eyes more i will i think everyone should watch this show it is very uh very accessible, uh, very relatable to for a lot of people. And um, I think it is quite touching as, and wholesome as well. I think uh, episode one, there is a scene that involves a chalkboard, I'll just say. And I think that was done exceptionally well because in the manga, it was done very well. But to have it animated and to have it conveyed in that, like... It's done very well, so yeah. I'm very happy. It's a very, it's a very good blend of just character development and comedic moments. Like it's, it, in the end, right? Like it's, it's not just like a regular high school comedy. A lot of the shows, like you can see that it also the the, the the same things are kind of portrayed in Comey. But when it comes to meshing in, you know, the development of Comey, the interactions between her and Tadano, it's a, it's very touching, and I think. All put together, it makes it for a very, very solid show for this anime season. Oh, um, Will and I forgot to mention, the mission that Tadano and uh, Komi wants to do is that 
Comey wants to have 100 friends. That's it, basically. Which is actually a lot, to be fair. A hundred yeah. friends is a lot that's of a people. Lot. Yeah. All right. right. Moving on to the next show that uh, both of us watched separately, but still want to talk about together. King, yeah, ranking of kings. Yeah, I think both of us are going to have that problem of kings ranking, ranking of kings. Uh, Doesn't matter. We're the same thing in this in this context. Holy crap! I really, really like this show. So this show it is uh, made by Wit Studio, based off of a web manga. That's correct. Yeah, and is airing right now, as we mentioned. It is about a deaf and mute prince. Well, not really mute. He's still he's still talks it's just that you know, a lot of the times he's making sounds so his name is boji uh he is the son of boss which is essentially the king of the kingdom that he resides in and he is supposedly next in line to take over the throne however literally within the first couple of seconds you just see this tiny tiny little naked boy with a tiny little crown on the top of his head. That is Boji. That is the deaf, powerless prince who is the heir to the throne of the boss kingdom. Now, a lot of people have problems with it because it's like, hey, look, why the fuck is this scrawny little kid who can't even talk, like, can't hear? Can't even is, wield a sword. Cannot, yeah, cannot hold a sword. Why is he supposed to be leading our kingdom? Doesn't matter. This kid is cute as fuck. It's it's a, it's a, actually it's a very adorable show. Uh, it's a story about overcoming adversity and disability to become the person who you truly are. And there is a duo, so it's not just Boji. There's also um kind of like this shadow kind of creature called a uh, Kage, and it and he talks, and he also has um. Uh, pretty tragic backstory as well and he kind of like sticks with boji together and they kind of bond and i guess the story just keeps progressing in addition to this there are people who doubt boji which in fact is almost everyone then there is uh the second prince and the queen the second queen i guess because the first queen who is boji's mom she passed away uh pretty early so uh, there's this like oh who should be on the throne because the second prince, uh, what's his name? Dida. Dida. He is accomplished. He is very eloquent, very smart, very good with the sword. And uh, in in many ways, he should be the next in line. Yeah. In fact, like basically the people of the, of the town, people of the kingdom, like view him as the rightful heir because of the fact that he exemplifies what it means to be a king. Whereas Boji, on the other hand, because he's never talked to anybody, he's incredibly weak and small, very meek as well. Like, they just never felt that, like, okay, he's he, he means well, but that's not what you want in someone who will be leading a king, a, a kingdom. Especially, you know, at a time when, you know, there is going to be war, there's going to be conflict. You don't necessarily want someone like that, or at least they think they don't want someone like that to lead their kingdom. Now, the art style of Ranking of Kings is extremely interesting because it is not what I would say your typical modern It looks old look. school. It, it looks, looks very like, old school. It actually, like, what I was going to say was that it kind of looked Ghibli-esque because when you have, like, the backdrop, it's very much, like, it looks like a painting rather than a still. Like, you can see, like, brush strokes and whenever, like, you look at the, the, the different shades of the mountains, of the skies, the way that they... The, 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 when when you look at how everything is constructed together, it looks more like art as opposed to just cells on a screen. And that's one thing I really, really like about the show. Also, it is very, um, as I said, it's not your modern anime look. So it almost is very, as Will said, old school. So imagine like the cartoons that, of the 1980s, 1990s that have these, like, very, very exaggerated features almost look kind of Western cartoon-esque in a weird way. I mean... Like, Pixar-looking. I mean, literally, like, Boji's, like, stepmom looks like a witch from a Ghibli movie. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, uh, and it's, and it's, it's proportions it's wonderful. and God, proportions yeah. are weird. But um, if you're, you're making it sound like it's a terrible thing. <laughs> no, it's just that it's un, it's different. That's all. That uh, and the whole point. Okay, everyone, of rank- I'm going to spend a couple minutes explaining why. Ranking of Kings is a good show, okay? Yeah, rather, about, than ha- okay. rather than having someone who's just going to say that it looks different. I was about to say the whole point of the anime Well, you that- took my thunder about Octaxi. I'm going to do the same thing to you, okay? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> but we agree. We agree. Like, definitely when it comes to the art style, it's not your typical anime, like, especially when you compare it to any of the stuff that's airing right now. It looks extremely different. Like You compared it to like Tacked Off Destiny, very different. Compared to 86 extremely different with Shoki Tensei. Very, very different because it's very like clearly defined. Things are a little bit more proportional whereas this one is definitely more cartoony but god damn when everything comes together it looks extremely gorgeous and magical. I I just, I really have nothing bad to say about the show. Right now I would say that it's the strongest show that I've watched this anime season and there's only been three episodes out. So one thing I really liked about the show as well was that you just can't help but feel good about Boji. Like you just, no matter what, you always just want to root for him because it's just him trying to traverse the world and make himself literally king material, knowing that he has so many roadblocks and so many fences in front of him. And he always just picks himself up and he just exemplifies what it means to just try and take on adversity head on. And then, of course, having his support character, Kage, also trying to live his own life, but also make himself better as well. When the two come together, it's a very beautiful combination that you wouldn't have expected from the beginning. And that's just one of those things that I think drives the plot. It drives the story. The music is great. The voice acting is really good, too. And the one thing that we should also talk about with the show is the fact that because Boji is deaf... He still needs to be able to talk to people. Actually, there's there's been the like, communication issues with both the shows that we watched for this episode for this season. Um, there's a lot of sign language. Am I allowed to talk now? Do you really want to do this, man? <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean, are you are you trying to say that you can't communicate? I can't communicate, man. Uh, especially after you kind of blew up on me, and I'm just now scared. I'm, I'm, You're not Comey, dude. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, yes, uh, sign language is featured prominently in Ranking of Kings. Uh, I have a history with American Sign Language, and I learned a lot of it. And I used I learned, to be- yeah, I learned Canadian Sign Language when I was a kid, but I haven't done any of it in like the last twenty five years. I used to be fluent, and then I guess because I don't use it. I kind of lost my fluency, but I am very uh, attached to, you know, sign language and uh, the deaf community at that time. And uh, this show is actually uh, supported or supervised by the Tokyo Federation of the Deaf, which is just awesome. The fact that you have an official national institution to oversee the sign language kind of shows how serious uh, which studio is about making this an authentic experience. Furthermore, there is a tweet by someone who works on Ranking of Kings, and she is also hard of hearing. And I think that quote where she says, literally, for the first time, I feel good about being hard of hearing. And it's just very touching. It's, it's just really good to see that, like, the deaf element of the show is not just a shtick. It's not, it's not just like, oh, he's deaf, and then that's what makes him likable. No, like they actually put a lot of time and effort into like studying sign language and then making it so that this kid, as hard as he's got it in his life, he's still able to communicate. He's still able to get by, and it's because he's got this wonderful supporting cast, which, depending on how much affinity they have with the main character, they'll do whatever they can to make him feel that he's accepted within the kingdom, despite the general town folk just shunning him because he can't talk. If he can't talk, then how can he be a king? Blah, blah, or he blah. can't hear, yeah, as well. So I really like ranking a kings. I also really, really like Comey Can't Communicate. I think these shows are these two shows are just a treat for this anime season. Literally, like within the first couple of minutes of watching Ranking of Kings, I was like, "This is Link, right from Zelda." Because <laughs> just he just just ha ah! ha ah! 
And he just starts swinging a little stick around. It's like this is basically like the opening of A Link to the Past. Wonderful. I I I think both these shows deservedly like you know are at the top of this anime season. And I think that you know when it comes to the grand scheme of things, when you look over like the whole history of anime, it's both of them are going to rank very highly. Popularity wise, it's going to be different. We know for sure that with Komi and the fan base it had from its manga uh, inception back in 2016 through to now definitely has a very strong fan base and king's ranking kind of came out of nowhere uh, i think the manga has been running for about two years but hasn't been that widely recept- as it, uh, accepted yet hopefully the anime adaptation changes those things so definitely watch these two shows and also go back to our previous episode to learn more about the other fall season anime premieres that we talked about and then check out those shows too a lot of good stuff this season all right so that is a heavy endorsement for Comey Can't Communicate and Ranking of Kings from Will and I. All right, let's go into news. Uh, Will. Do you want to start with? Okay, so pre-COVID, I would say Will and I, because um, like independently because we didn't know each other back then, would go to Japan quite often as kind of a tourist destination. Oh, yeah, I do. I would, I would try to go to Japan as often as I could. I mean, it, granted... From where we are to Japan, it's not that far. It's like several hours. And you can find like some pretty good deals on flights and hotels. So it's always like it's it's always on my mind of when's the next time I'm gonna be in Japan. And fortunately because of COVID, it's been really hard to get there. But it's definitely like a top tier destination for the both of us in terms of travel. And I think a lot of uh, people from Hong Kong yeah, too yeah. as well. So one of the things that I would always look forward to whenever I go to a big city like Tokyo is to visit arcade centers because especially from for me i play a lot of fighting games and the japan fighting game scene is ginormous because of arcades and they take it very very seriously comparatively to the west where it's kind of not a thing anymore definitely not anymore i mean you still find like little arcades or nowadays called barcades in New York and in LA. Yeah, but, but they're usually like retro games. Mostly like, like basically, I mean, like, I guess like the more updated ones would have, uh, I guess, Marvel Capcom 2. Or like Mortal Kombat, the old one. Yeah, but definitely it's more, like you said, definitely more for retro nostalgia as opposed to like the most up to date, the most like graphically intensive, the most like amazingly like competitive fighting games, music, like uh, rhythm games. Shoot 'em ups and all that. Driving games. Initial D, for example, is a big market. Or Gundam. One guy Midnight as well. That for yep. the driving ones. The Gundam ones where it's like, it's not just like an arcade cabinet. You actually have to enter a capsule. Yeah, it's like a whole egg thing. It's crazy. Those things are great. I mean, like when they first came into Hong Kong, the lines for those capsules was was ridiculous. Several hours for yeah. sure. So, Sega, you know the the video game company usually would be one of the main people that would open these arcade centers. I think Taito is another one. And then... Or, like, maybe some Bandai Namco one. It, Namco as well, actually. Exactly. So, uh, Ikibukuro is uh, a place... Like a district within Japan. Exactly. Uh, no, uh, within Tokyo. Tokyo, right? specifically, yeah. Yes. And uh, they are opening a new arcade center in on October 22nd. Now, I what, understand what, what, that... It's like, that. that's just it, though, right? Like, aren't they opening arcade centers all the time in japan what's so special about this one well several things the first thing that i think is really interesting is it is even though it's not really related to anime and manga there are a lot of video games there that are related to tangentially to anime and manga as well for example street fighter has a lot of spin-offs they even have an anime they even have a manga gundam obviously as well have so- you ever seen the the fate grand order arcade cabinets no. Is it the card game one? Yes. Uh, okay, so I have certain card games that were in Hong Kong, and it's like a card. It's like AR. Yeah. Like augmented reality where you like put each, the card each, down. Each card has like a, either like a code or like a chip in it, and when you put it onto the playing surface, it will literally be replicated in-game. And that it looked cool to me. I, I always thought that it would be too intense for me to play because I, I played a lot of it. It, it. it would take time to get tactically good at it, and tactical games – I tend to only do like all right, but whenever playing against somebody, I know I'm out of my league. But yet, the the fake grand order one looked really, really, really. I had a friend who said that you know he was on he was in Japan in Tokyo for a business trip, and as soon as he got off work, 
the first thing he would do would go to a Sega arcade and just play Fate Grand Order. So for people in the West especially who don't really understand the significance of arcades in Asia and especially in Japan, look no further to the Netflix exclusive show High Score Girl. And when you watch High Score Girl, you will undoubt, undoubtedly understand the importance of arcades in general. Yeah, if you, if you think of like arcades in like North America, or at least like our experience of arcades in Wait, North America. What arcades? Well, when there are ones, right? Right. Usually it's like at in a... In Chinatown? Or like at a Chuck E. Cheese, or like any, anytime there's like a large pizza place and there might be like one or two cabinets, it's usually like Pac-Man or it might be like House of the Dead. Definitely just more like, oh, here's like... a. Oh, or or like um, uh, what's that one? Um, Dave and Buster's, but most of them are like you get tickets to win uh, to, to to exchange for prizes. You play games there, like you know, not necessarily fun, but at least like the the gamification, the casinofication element of it. That's what gets you right. In Asia, specifically in this news story, in Japan, arcades are are, are the real deal. Yeah, and also because of COVID, and I just I guess business in regards to arcades have decreased these places are not opening rather they're closing down so having sega open up this new arcade center is just it's just a very wholesome thing for will and i basically and we just included it in because we want to talk about it for like several minutes which we already have yeah and to give it a little a little more backstory as well like the reason why this is so significant is because shortly before that Sega had announced that they were actually closing down one of their flagship arcade centers. And then this news comes out and says, actually, we're going to be opening a new one right across from it. And our theory is that it's due to rent, basically. But, well, actually, what happened was is that um, they actually were working on a fixed um, land rental of however many years. And then once it ends, it was not – it was non-renewable, non-negotiable – and then that was it. It wasn't so much a dispute. It was just the fact that they weren't willing to create a new license to allow for them to continue operating in that building. So then they decided. I think it was also like a, a, a change of ownership or at least like a new investor coming in to Sega and then helping to essentially put forward this new renovated arcade center that should be opening. Is it open now or opening soon? O- October 22nd. Oh, then it's open now then. Exactly. All right. So enough about that. We went on for quite a bit, but Will and I are very passionate about this. On to anime and manga news. I think one of the... <laughs> I don't know where to start, man. Okay, I'll start with the, the, the really fast one. So Demon Slayer, obviously, right now is extremely relevant. And uh, not only because of the Mugen Train movie, but because of the Mugen Train TV version that's airing right now. And, and then, of course, the, you know, the upcoming season of demon slayer coming up soon as well right uh should be in january or no end of december uh for season two so you there when the people in demon slayer do certain special moves there are these like words you know to uh, calligraphy in cal- like how do i say this there's a style like a font what's the what's the inverse of onomatopoeia rather than like a sound representing something. It's like literally words representing sound. And and, and they, 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 have, that, they have that. I mean, is that onomatopoeia? Yeah, that is onomatopoeia. I thought onomatopoeia was, it'll be around, of sound, rep- oh, never mind. Anyways, um, I know what you're talking about, right? And that's one of the things that is, is very like visually impressive about Demon Slayer. Like the, 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 the calligraphy, the, the art style, and the fonts. Demon Slayer altogether is a very nicely put together package, and if you haven't watched it yet, go check it out. Well, what's the, this? What's this news article about? We already the, know about Demon Slayer. The font is now being added to Adobe Fonts officially, <laughs> <laughs> like in their catalog. Like you can, when you go to Adobe products, you can actually use the font for Demon Slayer now. Like, I mean, I, actually, I don't know if it's now. There's, but... just, there's just almost nothing that Demon Slayer can't permeate, right? It's, it's taken over the anime industry, taking over the manga industry, the movie industry, video game industry. It's getting into all like your merch and your food and all that. What's next? Oh, why don't we talk to Adobe, of all people, and get our shit fucking official as a font, as part of their font package? Okay. That's... One, I had not expected, but also, like, incredible in terms of how far Demon Slayer has gone into 
in, in, into the real world, into everything that we see now. Another very well-known series that actually just finished airing is Tokyo Revengers. And, uh... Wait, it's finished? As oh, in, shit. like, the anime. Oh, okay, I thought every minute the manga's still running. Okay. No, no, the manga's still running. So, they have announced that they're doing a parody series called Todai Revengers, based off of the University of Tokyo time-traveling story. And I thought it was just hilarious, because Todai is very well known for being the Harvard of Japanese universities. And uh, they are doing a parody of Tokyo Revengers. I, I don't understand, Will. What, what the fuck's going on? I, I, I just think anime and manga is beautiful. I'm just happy to see these kind of things happen. Am I going to read it? Probably not. But Yeah, hey. I'm not, I'm not going to read it. But it's just, it's just cool, right? All right, Will. Do you know what else is cool? There are two special announcements. Uh, the first I one... I don't know which one to talk about first. Which, right. which, which, which one do you want to talk about first? Let's talk about Mob Psycho. Basically, Mob Psycho announced that they're doing a third season, and they are um, – it's coming out. I don't think they actually announced a date yet, but they announced the staff list. Now, the director for season one and two is not directing it anymore, even though he's now credited as the executive director. But uh, Takahiro Hasui, who also is well-known for doing uh, – Bungo Stray Dogs, and recently Skate the Infinity. He is now the new director for the third season. Uh, Will and I are not very hot on Skate the Infinity. but well, there... in terms of the plot, visually it's impressive, yes. but overall as an anime, it was, uh, yeah. But there's no denying that Skate the Infinity is ranked pretty high and very popular as well, and is very competently done. So having this director at the helm, I'm very... Uh, comforted and having the original two seasons director as the executive uh, director is also very comforting as well at least like, from a visual perspective because for me like i also really liked bungo straight dogs i'm pretty sure that visually they're in safe hands it's also been like two years since mob psycho 2 finished so it's i'm i'm very happy with it because you know that like the way that they got adapted and how much of the story is left i think it's been a long long wait but it's the wait is going to be sweet. I really think that season two... I mean, season one is also really good, but season two kind of elevated it to uh, really high heights, for me at least, personally. I give it a 10. Right. Season two was fucking Did phenomenal. I give it a 10 or a 9? Anyways, it's really, really good. And um, as you might expect, all the voice casts are returning, So, but that's not really news. But third season, woo! Okay. Now, before... Jason and I reveal the next bit of news. I, I would suggest to everybody just take take a seat. Sit down wherever you are. If you're not if you're standing, hold on to something so that you don't, you know, lose your, your footing, you don't fall, you don't collapse. Because what we're about to tell you is okay. ground baking, but earth shattering. Just are you ready, Jason? I was born ready, Will. So there is a series called No Game No Life. Oh, so it bad. is based on a light novel series of the same name. And there's currently one season out a long time ago. I forgot which year. 2013 to 14. And then there was a prequel movie called No Game No Life Zero that uh, is on Netflix exclusively. One of, I guess, the most uh, highly sought after memes and running gags is there are several first. There's Comey Can't Communicate, We'll Never Get an Anime Adaptation. Which it did. Which it did. Then there is Devil's a Part-Timer, We'll Never Get an Anime Adaptation. Which it did. And No Game, No Life, We'll Never Get an Anime Adaptation, even though they had a prequel movie, but then everyone was a little bit disappointed, but not really. Which will never get adapted, right? There's never going to be one because it's been fucking seven years. Eight? I think like five, four or five years since zero? Yeah, it's not going to happen. So... No Game, No Life, Volume 11 of the Light Novel series is released in Japan on November 24th. That in of itself is not really news. But to commemorate this, they said Monthly Comic, which is the place that houses No Game, No Life, said that there will be a special announcement releasing on November 27th and for you to stay tuned. 
if you're gonna panic, panic as calmly as possible. In the safety of your own home, of your own room, or just just don't lose your shit, okay? Because uh, we have lost our shit. It, it, it's not even just the fact that they're like releasing new like novel stuff and that they're doing a special announcement. They're also re-airing season one. Oh uh, no, uh, not they actually have re-aired it already. Okay, so it's already been going on. So they re-aired season one out of nowhere. So okay, in Japan though, and then they were like, okay. And then, soon after, this announcement happened. I actually have the chat archive between me and Will. So I first, and, and all caps lock says, dude. How many times? Like three times? Three times. Dude, dude, dude. And I say, there is a no game, no life. I was typing really fast, so it's a bit of a spelling error. Special announcement on November 27th. What the fuck is going to happen? You said, shut up. What? And then I said, everyone is freaking the fuck out. Which, to be fair... The internet was freaking the fuck out. And then I showed the image. And then Will is like, this is not a drill. Is this for real, right? I mean, the the the, the news not the news article, the little update that you shared with uh, me about the announcement, that post itself got 34,000 likes, 14,000 shares, and 2,600 people screaming, oh, my God, oh, my God, this is not a drill. Holy fuck, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. What's going to happen? Holy fuck, holy fuck. Yeah, it is not. this is not like a troll post or like an April Fool's. To my knowledge, this is legitimate. Now, what is the announcement about? Uh, look, we're all hoping for a season two, basically, is what it is. Literally, everyone is going to be like, the announcement is about season two, right? And then the other half are like, the announcement is that there's going to be no season two. Or the announcement is they're going to be a mobile game. Congratulations, guys. Or the announcement is the light novel series is going to end soon. I don't know. But come on. You aired season one recently. You have the release of the latest volume. And you supposedly just says, oh, yeah, guys, by the way, there's a special announcement. We're just going to chill. On, just chill on it for like a month. It's all good, right? No, nah, we're all freaking the fuck out. This better be season two or I will burn something. This is one of those situations where like, I just want to try and keep my expectations in check. But it's hard to because of how much I love No Game, No Life. I mean, I really like No Game, No Life as well, and it's very apparent that the story does not end at the end of season one. In fact, the story has a long way to go. A very long way to go. So, uh, let's hope that there's a season two. That's it, really. Yeah, I mean, like, these are the things where it's like, you you, you want to be as calm as possible, but you also know it could definitely happen. I mean, like, look, like, look, look, like you said, right? Devil's a part-timer. Come and communicate, and then other shows too, like for, Shaman King, for example. Jahayafu took six years to get one. Attack, Attack on Titan got, uh, took six years. Uh, certain Magical uh, Index or Railgun, which whichever the one, I think Railgun. It took Rail like gun. six years to get an adaptation. Yeah, Railgun T, which also performed very well uh, on terms of uh, ranking and popularity as well. So I'm excited because I also like si uh, Railgun a lot. A certain scientific railgun is the full name. There's a lot to be excited about here. Everything's coming back, Will. God. I mean, Devilman Crybaby also technically, right? Um, I don't know. What else has come back in the past? Like <laughs> Bleach. Oh, my God. We forgot about that. Yeah, Bleach is coming back, too. Yeah, after eight years, there's going to be a continuation and a, a actual, like, finishing, like, an actual completion of the overall Bleach manga story. I guess also like the Inuyasha, like Yashihime yep, yep, sequel. Yep. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna like say this prediction out loud, and let's see if it comes to fruition or not. I have no evidence of this. Hunter X Hunter oh is not God, no. only gonna get uh, the Brotherhood treatment because it kind of already does. The mangaka is gonna come out and being like, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish this shit, and I have it. All planned out. I'll do you one better. Like, guys, I haven't been doing anything for the last couple of years, right? Wrong. And Here he it drops is. everything in one go, in one huge omnibus. And then, I mean, One Piece is also ending, or in the final stages, so it's going to take several years. But still, right? The fact that you announced it. JoJo is coming back. It's just like, what the fuck is happening, Will? There's just a lot of things to look forward to over the next four or five years. 
I'm extremely excited as an anime and manga fan. Extremely excited for the culture that we're getting a lot of good things come our way, and it's not just another adaptation of a light novel. And it's not just... even though to be fair, No Good No Life is an adaptation of a light novel. And yeah, and so is like Devil's a Part Timer, and so on and so forth. But the thing is, right, Will, when they bring it back, when you when you think of things that people like revive from the dead usually think is a cash grab and in some ways it is it's like basically banking on nostalgia right but like this isn't it this is not just like trying to tap into like the everyday fans like, nostalgia factor and be like oh you know you liked this before so we're gonna do it again and then we're gonna get your money that's the, I, I i hope that's not it but but i want to reiterate for example things like comey can't communicate i was really worried about the anime adaptation even though i'm excited and it turns out it was great Devil's a part-timer. It looks great so far, and we don't have that much to go off of, but I think it, it looks good so far from what we have seen. Shaman King is the only one that I said that doesn't really have a lot of fanfare, but Shihaya Furu also, season three, did very well. AOT, that transferred studios, still did very, very well. Even Yashihime, which, to be fair, is kind of like, eh, it's okay. It still is quite popular within, like that specific fan base just because Inuyasha was super popular and people still vibe with it. So there's definitely like pockets of fans that no matter what, it's not just nostalgia for them. It's just the fact that they're able to enjoy something that makes them happy. Something that like they really, really liked watching when they were younger and are able to continue it, you know, in their adult life. All right. Or new fans picking it up. Yeah. So that's the news. Um, a lot actually has happened, so... I'm still kind of panicking. I'm still, like, extremely excited about this NGNL, like, No Get No Life announcements, or tease. God, I hope it's not just a tease. I'm so nervous. Like, I really am. It, no, it's it, there's, there's so much that, like, we don't know, but it's also so much that we want to know, too. So, okay, before we take our break and actually go into the main discussion topic, for me, when you... Well, I'm trying to think of... um the company that um, houses No Game, No Life, the light novel. When you release this announcement that you're going to make an announcement, which is like the most modern thing ever. Oh, we're going to make an announcement of an announcement later. But you have to, after so long, have to under, like they have to know, right, that people want season two. Originally with No Game, No Life Zero, my thoughts were, hey, the whole point is we revive it in some capacity, even though we're not continuing the story as a sequel, as a prequel, but then let's see what the the reception is, and then maybe we'll do a season two. That's what I thought, but it took so long that I kind of forgot about that. And then now to make this announcement, if they don't do season two, I really do think that everyone will revolt and be super pissed off because you have to know that by saying what you have already said, Everyone is expecting season two. You're teasing and playing with the goodwill of almost 10 years worth of wait and anguish and just general, like, just enjoyment of No Game No Life. Um, by the way, to answer your question about like, who has it, um, it's done by Media Factory, which I believe is under Katakawa, and then it's uh, published in English by Yen Press. Okay. Uh, the light novel for Yen Press. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Because there's no manga adaptation to my knowledge. There is, actually. Oh, really? Um, it's only got two volumes, though, um, and it's also published by Media Factory, but the English uh, publisher is Seven Seas. Yeah, but Seven Seas is dope. Uh, no, I'm just saying that there hasn't been a lot of ad- um, adaptations coming out for the uh, for the manga. So basically, and even less so with the anime. So basically, on uh, November at November twenty seventh, if uh, you do not hear from the good anime palette people. You should Google to see what the announcement for No Game No Life actually is. Because if it is not season two, I think Will and I... We will, will either be passed out from overexcitement or we'll be out in the streets revolting. Um, we will be out in the streets revolting because it's also funny because uh, November 27th is a Saturday and we are recording on that Saturday. Oh, God. And we're actually recording a very... like poignant episode too that that was gonna be a fun one to do so we stay tuned for the next month so we actually might not be recording and going outside just destroying things okay we're not we're not gonna break any rules or laws or whatever no imagine we record like our first section and then the news comes out during our break and they were just like sack the recording we're not doing this shit anymore gb is over nothing makes sense in this world 
what if we do it mid recording? Like one of us, usually it would be me refreshing it, and then we find out, and then we're like, hold the phone, hold the phone, and then. Uh. All right, that's the end of. Like, yeah, there's that. There's always like a Twitter bot where it's like, has so and so been renewed? No. Has so and so been renewed? No. Has so? They do one for JoJo. They do one for um, like how many days? Right. Yeah, they do one. They definitely have one for No Game No Life. All right, we have kind of ended the segment like three times over. Dude, we're we're just we're just passionate anime manga fans, man. Like this kind of shit. Like you you know that once you release release this news. People will lose their shit. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that a lot of our listeners have watched No Game No Life and do not expect that there will ever be a season two. So when you hear this news, I'm sure you are all crazy, going crazy right now if you've not heard it of it already. Yeah, if you want to just prepare yourself for the announcement on November 27th, just go watch No Game No Life and then watch Zero. And then hopefully the dates line up, and then you get the announcements on the 27th. And then we'll either joyously pass out together, or we will take the streets and destroy everything that we love and hate. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to talk about Fruits Basket, right? Oh, uh, yeah. We forgot a, about uh, it. Uh, Fruits Basket got a compilation movie, uh, uh, along with the prequel and an epilogue. And the new scenes of the epilogue will take place after the anime epilogue, which is done by... Uh, the mangaka herself. Okay. All if right. you haven't listened to AD5, our discussion on Fruits Basket, please watch Fruits Basket. It's so fucking good. I like how we forgot about uh, Fruits Basket and then just completely went off the rails with No Game, No Life. Dude, like... <sighs> okay, right. we're not doing it again. Yeah, we're <laughs> not doing it again. Uh, when we come back after the break, we will get into our main discussion topic. And then maybe we'll lose our shit a bit more at the end. But right now, let's go on our break. You guys get a break as well. And we'll come back and discuss today's topic. Peace. Back for the second half of today's episode of the Good Anime Palette Podcast, episode 20. We've taken a little bit of a breather, calmed down, though I'm still internally panicking a bit because of the no good, no life news. Uh, but hey, the show must go on. So it still will. Jason, how are you doing right now? I think uh, we've calmed down quite a bit. Quite a bit. And we are ready to then go crazy over our main discussion. Yeah, the hype's back up again. We're going to go fucking nuts for the second half because, goddamn, this is going to be a very, very fun episode to record. So, as I mentioned previously in other episodes, instead of doing topical stuff, which we will also continue to do, we have decided to also implement what we call episodic formats where... The style and structure of these episodes are the same, but the things that we talk about are different. We done that. We do that with seasonal premieres. We have done that with anime cleanup, and now we are doing another one, which we call "Gotta Watch Them All" because you know Pokemon, right? Yep. So this is going to be a, a long-standing series because after you know the two series we talk about today, and for however long it takes for us to finish. We'll probably continue by picking up some other uh, long-running series, whatever they may be. So Gotta Watch Them All is a format that Will and I conceived, which is basically I will watch a long-running series that Will wants me to watch or that I think we should wa- I should watch. And Will, in turn, will watch a long-running series that I think he should watch or collectively we think we should watch. The stipulation being that this long-running series has to extend over multiple seasons. And I think the benchmark or the cutoff point is three seasons or above, basically. So in usual, like, anime fashion, a lot of anime seasons don't get a second season, but the ones that do also rarely get a third season. And the ones that do get a third season, and that's it. Basically, the more seasons you get, it becomes very... More, more and more rare, basically. Yeah, very rarely do you see stuff where it's like a manga has like 15, 20 plus volumes. 
an anime like actually fully adapting it is minus shonens, yeah, minus shonens. So it's very rare for long running series to actually get fully adapted. But of course, you know, there's always like you know the Hunter Hunters, there's the FMAs, the the Naruto's, the Bleaches, and the Death Notes. So most of those are usually shonen series. So the two series that Will and I decided to embark a journey on is for me JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and for Will the Monogatari series. So what we're going to do now is each podcast season, we will have a got to watch them all se- segment, basically. And for that, we would watch in turn one section or segment of for Will would be the Monogatari series. For me would be Jojo. Will is all up to date with Jojo, kind of both the anime and the manga. And I have finished all of Monogatari series, the anime, and I've not read the light novel, but kind of whatever at this point so yeah the way the reason why we wanted to do that was rather than just because both series as long running as they are they're all broken up into a a varying level of like how many parts there are so for example with the monogatari series there's a lot of stories but each story is like one to at most maybe like two curves whereas the jojo series most parts are at least three curves Right. And to make things more complicated for the Monogatari series, there is not only different watch orders that you could do, but also within, let's say, a certain season, so to speak, they are then split into different story arcs very explicitly. So in a way, it's very easy for us to determine where the cutoff mark is. And with JoJo, literally is part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. That's it. So... Um, Jojo or Monogatari? Which one do you want to go first? Let's go with Monogatari. All right. I want to. I want to talk about that one first because I've. I'm, I. W- I wouldn't say that I was proven wrong. I always knew that the Monogatari series was a very excellent and very well received series overall. It just when I first watched the series, I was kind of taken taken aback by how dialogue heavy it was. So. We're talking specifically about Bakemonogatari, which is the first part, the first, the first season that you watch in terms of, I think in any watch order, you watch Bakemonogatari first, right? Yes. So, oh no, actually no. Oh, um, okay, this is where the complication comes in. It is very complicated. Do you actually want to explain a little bit about like why there's so many different watch orders? Well, first, uh, yes, I will, Will, but first thing I will do is explain what Monogatari series is. So, Monogatari series is a bunch of a series of light novel that has also been adapted into an anime and also a manga adaptation that is also i think pretty good as well monogatari means story and when you say when you hear bake monogatari for example it is what in english we call a portmanteau which is a combination of two words put together yep in this case it is bake mono which means monster and monogatari meaning story and it just so happens in this case that the end of bakemono and the beginning of monogatari is the same so then you splice it and put it together and a lot of the titles also follow this kind of format as well uh the light novel series is written by nishio which is a very well-known light novel author and all of the adaptations of the Monogatari series is done by Studio Shaft, which I think for a lot of people, they're mostly well known for uh, the Madoka Magica series. Recently, they have also done um, Pretty Boy Detective Club, which is also another uh, series done by Nishio as well, which I thought was okay. That's it. The Monogatari series is extremely well known for its heavy, heavy use of dialogue and also for very dense, packed stories that intertwine. And uh, it's kind of crazy, actually, to be honest. And it's essentially watching a light novel. Yeah, because the, when we say that is dialogue heavy, you, when, you, when you hear that, you think, oh, it's just people you know, talking. But then here... Literally, all the backgrounds are kind of static and nothing happens other than talking. 
And when they talk, they don't only talk very fast, but they talk a lot. I think like 95% of an episode, someone is talking. And then the other 5%, when there's no one talking, there is like sections of the light novel that pertains to that specific scene or that specific part of the light novel. It's it's very artistically well done. I like it a lot. And I think in the beginning, the reason why I got a little bit put off by it was just because of how heavy the dialogue was and how much like attention you need to put into understanding the story. And for someone that, you know, I guess initially when watching anime, it was just more like, well, when are you going to start fighting? When's the edgy shit going to start? When's someone going to get decapitated or when's when when's this fight gonna break out to be fair all those do happen but the dialogue is front and center the main attraction i mean the the the, the whole series itself is called monogatari it's a story right and so therefore that should always be at the forefront the monogatari series stars uh the main character of koyomi araragi and he is a third year high school student and that is the easiest thing I can say because beyond that, uh, you get a bunch of creatures, supernatural elements, different, like really violent stuff, gory stuff, love, hate, all these weird things got put together. That was a waterball. Sorry about that. Uh, and well, actually, this might be a, a, a mm-hmm. good point to say as well. Like, because of how dense both JoJo and Monogatari stories are. We will have a sort of, you know, kind of mini break. So it will be before the break is just basically overview and general thoughts about our respective series. And then after that little mini break will be more sort of spoilery content. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. Th- thank you, Will, for uh, uh, reminding me and reminding the viewers that this is how it's going to yeah, go. Because it would be really difficult to talk about the series without going into the actual nitty gritty of both parts that we watched. So we do appreciate, of course, that if you don't want to get spoiled, we will give you a buffer in terms of when we will move into spoiler territory. Now, in regards to the Monogatari series, there are several things that, as a person that's unfamiliar with the series, should know. The first thing is that the Monogatari series is extremely complicated in terms of timeline and events that occur at the same time, before or after. So... Th- that's a whole mess. Not a whole mess, but like trying to figure it out is part of the point. The other thing that I think that Monogatari series is very well known for is the harems and several rather controversial issues that Will and I will undoubtedly have to talk about at some point. Yeah, dude, it's a, a lot of stuff to talk and, about. And the thing is that one of those controversial issues, even though it is in the Bakke Monogatari, it features a lot of in Nisei. So we'll figure it out when we get there. So it's a long journey. So hopefully you enjoy the ride. Now with Jojo, it was rather easy to determine the order that you should watch it. Cause part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, and part six. That, that That's essentially it. Right. Will? yeah, I mean, part six coming out uh, fairly soon, but yeah, basically it's phantom blood, battle tendencies, Stardust crusaders, diamond is unbreakable, Golden Wind, and then the upcoming Stone Ocean. Right, and uh, season one of the anime is both part one, which is Phantom Blood, and part two, which is Battle Tendency, but I only watched part one. Now, the Monogatari series, unfortunately, is not that straightforward. There are, to my knowledge, three main watching orders. The first one is novel release order, which in my opinion is the right order to consume, especially if it's your first time. That's the order that I went, and I thoroughly enjoyed that experience. Basically, you watch it in the order that Nishio, the author of the Monogatari series, releases the novels. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Unfortunately, because of, let's say, production issues and delays and whatnot, Kizu Monogatari, which is a trilogy of movies and is technically right after the release of Bakke Monogatari in terms of novel watch order, was not released until way later due to, as I said, production issues and delays. So now it's fine because the three movies are out. So then you can watch it in novel release order. But back then you couldn't. So there's the second order, which is broadcast watch order, which is the order in which Studio Shaft released the anime adaptation. 
and mainly it concerns Kizu Monogatari. Okay. Then there is the third, I would say, most popular watch order, which is the chronological watch order, which is you watch everything as it happens in sequential order in terms of the events that happen in the series. I would recommend this only as a second watch through or more. If it's your first watch through, do not do this because there are certain things that are alluded to or certain things that are not supposed you're not supposed to know that gets revealed way early or way later and stuff like that. So it's a it's a big mess. So those are really the three main watch orders. And Will is watching it in novel release order. Yeah. So after uh, well, now that I finished uh, Bakemonogatari, the next part will be watching the uh, the movie series of uh, Kizu Monogatari. Then afterwards is Nisei Monogatari, and that should be the end of part one. Or no. is or is Neko Black in there? Neko Black is in there. Right. Okay. So if it wasn't already confusing enough, just just listen uh, just listen along uh for the series at least then uh you know you'll be hearing my journey throughout the the light novel order of the monogatari series and i gotta say so far as a start Pokemon monogatari is very good and so it's very very good and so does the rest of the internet or at least uh my anime list is concerned because it is ranked 8.35 is ranked 185 and popularity 76 i also have to note that the Monogatari series, the light novel first season, is ranked 12, and the popularity is 243 with a score of 8.96. That is insane. That is crazy. It's, it's one of the most popular series of all time. And I would say that it is my favorite series of all time as well. I used to be so against this kind of thinking until I watched all of it. And then now I'm on the bandwagon that thinking that this is the best series of all time. All right. Well, so what do you think of Bakemonogatari besides the positive stuff that you have said already? First and foremost, the show came out in 2009. Okay. It doesn't look like it's from 2009. It looks amazing. It's very, very very beautiful and the thing i like about the the series as well it's like it's very like the 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 definition of characters the definition of of image color shape and size and everything it's it's incredibly well thought i also like that whenever it's like certain things stick out very very vividly for you where like for example when you're drawing the characters the outlines of them it's usually just like a like a, usually like a thin black line but for this one it's like as thin as it is it's also extremely extremely dark so you know that like this character is in the forefront yes you have a very beautiful backdrop as well but you don't focus on that you focus on the character and i also like the transitions between still image and then red screen black screen blue screen whatever screen and then there's just words and words and words one thing i do like as well is whenever they do the openings of um, each episode not so much the not so much like the actual like music opening but the title sequence and at the bottom it tells you what font it's written in yes it's i really like that part as well it's that's the thing the, the thing that i really like about the about bakamon Gatry so far is because it's so dialogue heavy that it does really well when it comes to like self-referential humor. Like like me- it's very meta. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of cultural references as well. The thing that Will mentioned in terms of the colored screens is really hard to convey to you through words. But I would say that it is very stylish. Like as you, well. you knew what you knew exactly what I meant. Like, yes, of as, course. As ambiguous as I was and talking about color, it's like how do you describe color? It's like oh, blue is blue, white is white, lines are lines. But like when I when I talk to you about that, like you mean it's like yep, I know what Will's talking about. And and you know what Will? Uh, each of those colors actually are extremely important because it's a, a running theme throughout the rest of the Monogatari series that is only done in the anime adaptation. But Will mentioned in terms of the look. I have to say that one of the more unique things about the Monogatari series is how empty it is. And what I mean by that is, other than the main characters, the voice cast, and the main characters, you know, interacting with one another, there is no, like, other people present in any of the backgrounds, in any of the foregrounds. It's just very empty, and it's only the characters that are supposed to be there 
interacting, and that's it. Very rarely do you see anything more than three characters in a scene. And usually, there I mean, not usually, there is no, like, oh, superfluous character. There is no, like, oh, a classroom that's supposed to be filled with people. There are scenes that are classrooms that are supposed to be filled with people, but there is no one's there. So I thought that that was pretty interesting. Uh, I think one of the other interesting things is the stylistic choices that are done, such as the colored screens, which is really hard to explain. But needless to say that throughout the Monogatari series, certain color screens flash before your eyes to signify something. I can't really tell you what that something is, even though I know what that is. But a lot of people get worried because they see those screens and they're like, oh my God, there are so many texts. What is going on? And then you either have to pause it to read it or they're like, this is way too much. I can't bear this. What I will tell you is you don't have to read every single screen and you don't have to pause and read all of it. But it is interesting because those screens actually contain a lot of information, and, and a lot of those information is extracted from the original light novel, usually from the perspective of the person that's having that conversation. So, yeah, I think that's it. Bakemonogatari is 15 episodes. Originally, it aired 12, and then the last three were broadcast online and then subsequently was available through physical media like Blu-rays and DVDs and whatnot. Yeah, why is it, why did they make it so difficult in terms of releasing shit? It's it's so confusing. I think there was some planning issue. Like I think originally they wanted to do all 15. So I don't know why. Uh the other thing about the Monogatari, Bakken Monogatari is that it's split into five arcs. And each arc usually is like two to five episodes. Yeah. And, Will, do you want to go through them in order, or do you want to, like, how do you want to go about this? Because, for me, I know everything, and you just know Bakemonogatari, just like how I only know Jojo Part 1, and you know everything. And I think we wanted, that was the point, because it's like a journey that you, the listeners, are coming with us as we learn, as we go. But we also have a guide who knows everything, so... The, the sage, right? The, sage, the Monogatari yeah. sage. So, um, actually, kind of similar to how I, we did our um, previous um, episode. Not not the regular episode, but for AD, uh, where we talked about fruits basket and like the whole zodiac animal thing. This one, they follow a similar kind of like story, not story, but like the main characters that we have in this series all have some. Most of them have some sort of animal or monster representation and that actually like, lays out the the sequence of well, which arcs come out first so i think the first one was crab yeah hitagi right? crab yeah and then afterwards was uh snail yeah mayoi snail uh and then afterwards was uh, monkey. monkey right suruga monkey yeah and then uh, and then uh it would be after monkey is is, is snake snake, snake. not a co snake and then that one is cat tubasa cat that's correct and each of them are like some are more episodes, some are less episodes, but they're at least two episodes each, if not more. All right, well, what do you think of Bakemonogatari? It's really good. It's, it's, <laughs> I think it's, we've said that like five times, but yeah. But it's it's, it's it, you you can't really say much else about it other than it's just a fantastic watch. Like the 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 color composition is wonderful. The sound effects. That's the thing. It's not just the music. The sound effects are really, really good as well. So yeah. whoever like did the sound design, hey, props to you, man. Like this was actually like a very, very well put together in all aspects, both from a listening perspective and also from a watch perspective. And if I could expand on the listening part, Monogatari series is also well known for their openings because yeah, yeah, that that's what we want to talk about as well, right? Just like there's five story arcs within just fifteen episodes, there's also five different openings each sung by the voice actress who is prominently featured in that arc. So one of, okay, so we will rank the OPs because that's what we do as the GAP bros. But I have to say first, if you have listened to our data episode, which is episode seven, you would know that uh, Hitagi Senju Gahara who is represented by the crab and which is the first arc of the Bakemonogatari series is my number one waifu of all time. I really like that character in 
almost every aspect. And I think her character development, even within Bakemonogatari, is really, really well done. Um, I think the next one that I like, and I think a lot of people like, is Hanakawa Tsubasa, which is the cat. And uh, how do I say this? Usually it's Senju Gahara versus Hanakawa, basically. Would you say so, Will? If we're just talking specifically about Bakemonogatari, absolutely. Yes, because there are more characters that show up later on. I mean, there's so many arcs and volumes and shit. Like, you're you're not just going to be focusing on the... I, I think so far there are nine characters that are featured in Bakemonogatari. Uh... Right? There's the male MC. There's five girls. The male MC's siblings, which is two of them. And then there's the other guy. Uh, there is Meme Oshino, which is kind yeah. of like the... The sage, actually, within Bakemonogatari. So I think that's the nine. And then there is a silent character that is oh, okay. extremely important. There you go. Ten. So there's ten characters. But she doesn't have a speaking role. But yes. Uh, but she will be very important as the series develops. Super important. All right. Without going into spoilers, Will, um, which one is your favorite? Uh, waifu? No, no, not waifu. Well, I, know. I mean, I'm team Hanakawa at the moment. Yeah. But which one is your favorite storyline out of the five arcs? From the get go, I felt that it was, of course, like just to set the bar and to let you know, like this is what you're gonna like watch. This is what you're gonna expect when you're watching the Monogatari series. The crap arc was a very good opening into what this whole this this whole world of Monogatari is going to be, because you have a very uh, abrasive and brash female lead who literally just breaks onto the screen and just tells you like yes hi i'm hitagi sinjigahara i have a stapler in my hand and then you just watch the next three episodes i think the, the crab arc is three episodes three or four uh i wrote it down it is two oh, episodes. actually two episodes yeah and like just those two episodes alone already set the tone for what the rest of this series is going to be like it doesn't tell you the whole story but it's like after watching those two episodes, you're either in or you're out. And I, after watching, I was like, okay, like I'm in. Give me the rest of this shit. Um, the next arc, which is the snail arc, was I thought it was like a very more sort of like heartwarming kind of story arc. Definitely more wholesome. Um, we'll, we'll go into that arc specifically a little bit in a little more detail later. Right. Spoiler shit for sure. Um. It, it was nice, it, it definitely, because there was a lot of like high intensity in the first. Okay, when I say intensity, it's not like people are fighting. There's like quick action seats. It's because of the fact that when you have such a very, very outspoken and direct main character as Senshikahara, and also you have Araragi, who is just as receptive and just as talkative as her. There's a lot of back and forth, and like just it, it takes a toll on you mentally and emotionally but that's when you get emotionally vested into it you really have the period yeah i thought then you have the period with like the the snail arc which calms things down a little bit Mm -hmm. it definitely becomes a little bit more wholesome you really do have to focus a lot in terms of paying attention to the anime because the dialogue even though there's a lot i think a lot of it is not fluff it's actually extremely all of them are extremely important i would say a lot of these dialogues I think another thing that is important is, for me, I knew that the Monogatari series was quite bloody and violent. But up until this point, there wasn't a lot of blood and guts and whatnot. And then we got to the monkey. And that's when I finally realized that, oh, wow, this is actually quite violent. Yeah. And then afterwards, you go into the snake arc. And then that wasn't like the... That was just weird. That wasn't like the fucked up, like, holy shit, this is brutal. This is the, oh, wow, they really went there. Okay. Yep. No, this is like the the, the, the deepest the deepest of like the dark depths of what Monogatari can be. I'm sure it's going to get darker later on, but that definitely set the tone for what you should expect. That it, It's going to be edgy. It's going to be dense in dialogue. It's going to be very, very bloody. But it's also stylish, gonna be, But it's also going to be very cute and wholesome and magical and mysterious and supernatural. And it's it, When you try and actually describe what the Monogatari series is by genre, I don't know how many tags you have to put on it. 
I mean, I would say harem. I would say comedy. I would say romance. I would say supernatural. I would say actually one of them I won't say because uh, the because it's a spoiler. Yeah. But uh, I think Will knows what I'm talking about. But yeah, all those are applicable for sure. Mystery, romance, supernatural are the yep, three tags for, also, yeah. for uh, B- uh, Bakemonogatari. But I guess it's like supernatural and mystery most of the time they come like hand in hand. Now, moving on to the last part, which is the cat arc. That was, I, I think, basically, as, as I said, like what the beginning, the, the, the crab arc, sets the tone for how the rest of the story is going to go. The cat arc is... An accentuation of it. Yes. The, there's a reason why the cat arc is five episodes and is the longest arc of the whole Bakemonogatari. I also think that one, the the last broadcast episode, which is episode 12, to me, I re, that's my favorite episode of Bakemonogatari because, as in Monogatari fashion, nothing really happens at all, really, in that episode. But... There is, it's kind of tense, and then all I can tell you is... Actually, it's not really spoiler per se. The events that happen in there is essentially there is a car ride, and there is a hike. I know that that sounds vague, and that's by definition, that's the way it is. But if you really boil it down to the essence of Monogatari series in terms of what happens, it is as mundane as that. Nothing but, happens. But then it is so interesting to me. Edgy made me feel very uncomfortable and tense. Watching that whole exchange, we would discuss later on in the latter part of this discussion. But it's good, isn't it? Like nothing happens, but everything happens. Yep, exactly. That's the thing about Bakemonogatari. It's like it, the, the old adage is, of course, could be overused, but sometimes less is more. But at the same time, like more is even more. Right. Like, you 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 could have like Jason said, you can have empty panels. You can have just lines of script, and then that's it. Just because like there's nothing on there doesn't mean nothing's happening, and that's the thing about Maki Monogatari. And I hope that the rest of the Monogatari series holds up. Congratulations, it does hold up. Oh, hell yeah! Okay. All right. Now that we are done with the non-spoilery talk of Maki Monogatari, it is my turn to talk about JoJo. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a manga series. It is a super super long running manga series, and part one is actually not all of season one of the. 2012 anime. Yes, yeah, we should be clear about that because there are actually three adaptations of that part. There is the original OVA, which came out a long time ago. There is a movie version of Phantom Blood. And the one that we're talking about here, which Jason's going to be talking about now, is the 2012 adaptation of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 1 Phantom Blood. And uh, to be frank, uh, a lot of people consider the 2012 anime adaptation and what proceeds onwards as the definitive JoJo Bizarre Adventure watching experience. Within the first season of JoJo, similarly with uh, with the Monogatari series, although this is the only time that it has happened, Part 1, Phantom Blood, and Part 2, Battle Tendency, was smacked together as one season of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, which is very similar to Monogatari series, but from their point onwards, Part 3, 4, 5, and 6, they don't follow that rule. Uh, part episode one to nine is Phantom Blood, and they make it very explicit when it ends that this is the end of part one, and then the rest of the season one is then dedicated to uh, part two, which is Battle Tendency. I only watched the first nine episodes, and um, this would actually mark the third time I have watched JoJo, the twenty twelve release. I stopped every time mainly because I just didn't find it that interesting and I also find it like just very whatever. And if you were to scour the internet, almost everyone would say, "Yeah, Phantom Blood is pretty shit, but you have to watch it because it's extremely important from a storyline perspective." And trust me, the as in I'm saying as the internet, trust me, after Phantom Blood comes Battle Tendency and that's already infinitely better. And then the other part five, a uh, part three, four, and five is like magical. Will, would you agree with that assessment? Each part itself is minus, of course, Phantom Blood, very widely acclaimed. I, I, I think, of course, we already know, as many people should actually know as well, that the JoJo fan base is extremely diehard, and it's also because of the fact that a lot of stuff is very meme worthy. 
within JoJo. I think like even Monogatari, there's also like a fair amount of memes as well. I would say that's what happens when you get popularity with a series, anyway. Yeah, I would say that before I even decided to watch anything JoJo, I was already like exposed to all the memes because that's just the way it is. And to be fair, when I saw those memes, I'm like. Yeah, those are pretty good memes. Even I don't know the context or words from other than JoJo. And in part one already, there was already some of these very well-known memes. But that was the origin. And I was like, oh, right. That's where that came from. That's where that came from. Oh, that music that everyone likes, that's actually from there. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So, the, of course, it's like, you know, popular anime series permeates into just general popular culture. And therefore, even if you haven't consumed it directly you will have had some exposure to it. Now, just how I described and talked about the aesthetic of the Bakemonogatari series, what did you think about Part 1, Phantom Blood, the David Productions adaptation of Judges of Bizarre Adventure? I think one of the things that I will undeniably give credit to, even during my first two abandoned rewatches, was the use of color. And I think the use of color is kind of unique because the color scheme that they use is actually kind of weird. For example, darkness is not really black. I mean, there are th those moments, but sometimes it's purple. Oh, someone's hair is blonde, actually, but then out of nowhere, like when they are in the shade, it just turns like lime green or pink. And their use of colors are so weird in terms of when i mean by weird i don't mean it is bad what i mean is when you think about conventionally how you would use a color palette like that jojo is like nah fuck that and i think that is a lot of jojo which is you grab the rules that are technically the rules that all anime and manga should abide by and then jojo wraps it in a box you know pack it all nice and neat and then throws it down a fucking river to the bottom of the river to go to the ocean and it sinks at the bottom because jojo is so stupid and when i mean by so stupid i mean it in the best positive way possible because it is really good but it is so stupid there was one section that i that will i think would get a kick out of which is there is a section about a name of a sword let's just say and the sword has a name something was done to that sword a very minor tweak and i was just like bro what the fuck is this but also at the same time i'm kind of jiving with it it's pretty dumb but it's so dumb but it's so good would you say as well because of like the the the, the series has been running for a long time and it basically takes inspiration from a lot of long running series like for example like let's just talk about character design yes uh the arnold schwarzenegger sylvester stallone the 19 because this manga, part one, was made in 1987. So what was popular? Rocky, Rambo. And know. in Japan, Fist of the North Star. Exactly. So that build of basically your chest, torso, is larger than – your head is like the smallest thing ever, basically. Their neck is like the, literally the size of their shoulders. Like, there's like actually, like, where does the chin end and like the shoulders begin? It's just one whole, one whole chunk of muscle and bone. So, this is interesting because when I think of JoJo nowadays, the word that I would associate with JoJo is metrosexual, flamboyant, flamboyant. And part one has n very, very little of that. They do have that, particularly with I, uh, the the villain, which I will just reveal right now because it comes to no surprise. Oh, no. He's approaching me. Yeah. Dio. Dio Brando, right? Colonel Dio this. Right. Yeah. All the memes and everything. So it's not a spoiler to say that Dio is not only a pivotal villain in part one, but just a pivotal meme in general. Uh, Jojo is Joestar, which is the main character in part one as well him and Dio kind of have this relationship that uh, progresses through many years, actually. of and uh, But it's encapsulated in part one. And then it's very uh, interesting to see where it will lead off to in part two. But um, I think that part one is so cheesy. It's, it's cheesier than anything out of a dairy farm. Like, I, 
I don't know, man. Like, okay, it's really, really good. Like, honestly, like, I would say an 8 out of 10 would be my assessment. I gave it an 8 out of 10 as well. And I think that um, I should have continued and persevered just a little bit more. I stopped at, like, episode 2 or 3. And to be fair, those episodes were very dry. There was That was the reason why a lot of people – I mean, even I had to do a second try just to finish the first part of JoJo. It's also a lot bloodier than I thought. Uh, I know that there was some, like, a little bit of blood because the first couple of episodes have that. But when you get on to the later uh, half of part one, so, like, episode, let's say, four onwards, you then see, like, wow, this is actually very, very violent. But it's not, like, Tokyo Ghoul bloody violent. It's just, if you think about it, oh, that person had his head decapitated. Yeah, that's that's pretty violent. Not to mention these are like little towers of like hulking muscle just beating the fuck out of each other. It's going to be brutal. I think the other thing that I would like to mention is if to my knowledge of the nine episodes, I think at least four of those nine episodes is one battle. And then like the last couple of episodes is like the wrap up basically. Or actually the last episode is a wrap up. But a lot of time is spent introducing the characters and creating context and bad backstory. And really, the main meat of Phantom Blood is technically one kind of action scene, really. In, in a way, like, I'm not saying that Bucky Monogatari and JoJo Part 1 are the same, but there's definitely, like, their own varying levels of dense dialogue, of very, very, like, good representation of saying a lot but not meaning a lot and also not saying much but also representing a lot in in a sense it's it's also fairly meta though i would admit that it's nowhere near as meta as um as, as bakemonogatari but that's just one of the things that i liked about jo- jo- jojo the jojo series just as much as jason loves the monogatari series the overall jojo series is my personal favorite of all time of course i have standalone series of standalone seasons for anime that like i have at the top but overall jojo is fucking great i think this is a good time to maybe take a a, a quick like moment oh, of silence so no no so uh, not yet? okay i would say uh one thing which is let's talk about the op and ed for both monogatari oh and right jojo hell yeah let's so i would say the op for jojo is extremely old school in a way that I really appreciate. Uh, and it fits extremely well with the aesthetics and feel of part one. The ED, all I will just say is, if you are up to date with your anime memes, you will know exactly what the ED is. And uh, yeah, there's no other way to describe that. I think that going forward, I'm heavily invested in JoJo right now. I think that there's only – if people say that it only gets better, I am ecstatic to see where it goes from here. And I can say the same for um, for the Monogatari series as a whole. I know that you know Jason did mention that there are going to be parts that are – probably going to be a little bit more lukewarm. But there's also going to be some parts that are going to be a lot darker, a lot funnier, a lot fluffier. That's just, that's just generally it. It's hard to really describe what the whole Monogatari series is. It's very first and foremost, like, easy to figure out what JoJo's all about, but you just want to enjoy the journey. Whereas there's a lot of mystery behind Baki Monogatari and then all the subsequent parts, and I'm ready for it. All right. So now going back to the Monogatari series real quick before we do our spoiler break is the five OPs that were um... – featured in the Bakimonogatari series. Uh, Will, do you want to talk about the OP list? Yeah, so as mentioned in terms of the order parts, right? you had Hitagi Crab, Mayoi Snail, Suruga Monkey, Nariko Snake, and Tsubasa Cats. And with each respective voice actress singing their own theme song, their own opening song, which I thought was wonderful, by the way. Um, so five openings, one ending... Um, I think that the um, the first opening, which was sung by um, the voice actress for Shinji Kahara, Staple Staple. Uh, A then, staple Staple. Oh, Staple Staple, yes. Uh, the second, uh, which is the, um, the snail one, uh, sung by uh, Emiri Kato, uh, uh, who voices Yamayoi uh, Hachikuji, is called 
Kaeri Michi. The third opening is Ambivalent World, which is sung by the voice actors for Suruga. Fourth one is, I think, the most most well known of them all, which is Renai Circulation or Love Circulation, sung by none other than Kanahana Zawa, who is also uh, Nadeko Sengoku in the Bakemonogatari uh, series. And then the final one, uh, Sugar Sweet Nightmare, sung by Yui Horie, who is the voice actress for Hanakawa Tsubasa. All right, well, do you want to go from bottom up? I think we should go from the bottom up, right? Yep, let's do it. All right, uh, my last of the five is the one sung by the snail, which is the second opening. Um, sung by the Mayui character. Mayui uh, Hachikuchi. Yes. Um, I think that song, although I don't like it that much, I think is extremely appropriate for the character to sing. But personally, as my preference, I don't like it that much. What do you think, Will? I Okay. Uh, the next, the one that I actually had for the bottom one was, again, bottom doesn't mean it's bad we have to do this for the purpose of doing a tier list anyway number five for me was um surugo monkey oh okay yeah that was my number four i think just because it, it not to say like using the word generic here is not great but it's also just it sounds very similar to like some of the shonen openings that came out in that era anyway so it wasn't that special for me yeah, uh, it was still good though. Still good. I, I, I agree with that statement. Okay, so I just revealed that monkey is um, n- my number four. So what was your number four? Subasa cat. I thought that that one was, eh. I thought it was okay. it was better than the uh, Zuruga monkey um, opening, but I don't know. It just didn't seem all that much more hype or different from the other three that I have ranked higher than it, than this one. Okay. Uh, my number three is uh, Staple Stable, the crab. Same here. I had that one as number three. I think like if, if you were to go by the definitive song for Bakemonogatari, it would be Staple Stable because it's the first one. It's also one of the central characters in Central Kahara. She's fucking awesome. But I think like it, it's – overall, the song itself is, is decent. I just like the overall title sequence when put together – how it meshes with like real life cinematography, like, real life photography of Japan, and it features a lot of trains, and I really like trains, especially the GR line in Japan. So. It also features a lot of staplers. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, my second is Cat. What about yours, Will? <laughs> my second is um, Love Circulation. Right. Which, which is, is the Nadaka s- Snake. Right. And for me, number one is uh, the snake, Renai Circulation. I think the thing is with the song, it's, okay, meme-worthy, of course, but it's just, it's just one of the most popular anime openings of all time. Like, if we talk about Spotify data, it's, I think, top 10 in terms of, like, it, it's comparable to all the theme songs as Lisa's ever done. And Lisa is a natural, like, songwriter, singer, right? Whereas Hanakawa is a voice actress, and, oh, my God, like, it's such a bubbly song. You know the term moe, listeners? Yeah. That is Rinai Circulation exactly, basically. Cute moe? That's that song. And you can't say that it's not fluffy because literally in the middle, the lyrics are fura, fura, which is like literally fluffy, fluffy. I'm like, oh, God, I love you, Kanahana. <laughs> All right, so now that we have ranked all our... Op- well, actually, now that I explain to you why I picked... Um, Snail as my number one. Yeah, why is that? I like Eurodance. I like that kind of Japanese happy uh, hardcore. Like Camarel Dancing, which is that really like meme like Swedish Eurodance song. It sounds just like that, and I really like that I, shit. I mean, I like Initial D and Eurobeats is like a staple part, like a, a very core part of Initial D. But I just I just liked the other songs in terms of fitting with the themes, fitting with just the times but i also understand why you like the snail song that much because it's also just crazy wacky like this this young girl like not even knowing what the fuck's going on in the world just going about her day and then like just doing random shenanigans and also the fact that i like the song a lot too so i also have to say one more thing though which is even though we just ranked all five openings to me it's not number one in terms of 
song that is used in Bakemonogatari. I think the ED, which is sung by the Senju Gahara uh, voice actress, and is especially prominent at the end of episode 12, is probably one of the most well-known EDs of all time and is my favorite song of Bakemonogatari. Do you remember that song, Will? Was that actually sung by... Oh, wait, no. Mm. No, because I think the song you're talking about is done by Supercell. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I made a mistake. Yeah. yeah. There, uh, there, Kimi no it... Shiranai Monogatari, or The Story You Don't Know, which actually is very fitting for the overall series. There is a point where I think she does uh, a rendition of that, but in this case, it is not sung by the voice actress herself. But I really, really like that song, and I uh, listen to it probably the most out of all the Monogatari's openings and endings. It is a good song. The thing is, though, like with with the um, the the music for Book of uh, Bakemon Monogatari, I would definitely add it to my Spotify playlist. But I also wouldn't add the JoJo ones because it's I mean like they're good songs. It's just it's I, I know them for the memes, and they'll always be memes for me. But uh, I still love the series overall. So I think this is a good time to maybe take a, a quick. Break. Couple, of, couple of seconds break for spoilers right right so okay. so uh hold. moment of silence for five seconds all right okay now if you are joining us again congratulations you are now in the spoilery section of jojo's bizarre adventure part one and also bakemonogatari we will not spoil or try our best not to spoil anything after that and usually we're worried about spoilers but thank god that i know a lot about monogatari and thank god that will knows a lot about jojo such that if we were to ever encroach on that point we can stop each other but in terms of part one which is episode one to nine of jojo's bizarre adventure season one and baki monogatari all of it as well There's all there. of it we are now going to spoil it okay how do you, which one do you want to go first to hanakawa is fucking hot <laughs> I mean, do you do you remember the first scene of Bakemonogatari? Yes, it's it's very iconic, isn't it, dude? It's oh my god, like literally the best panty shot of guy, all time. Guy waiting at the, the the train crossing, girl walking with glasses. No, 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 it's not train crossing. It is a crosswalk. Crosswalk, yeah. So no, no train. The train does show up later on, but yeah, her walking, glasses, panty shot. Yes, <laughs> no, no, but it's not even that. There's a panty shot, and it's featured extremely prominently. But then there's a timer. There's a timer in the corner being like, with with Aragi's eyes, seeing like, oh, how long is he eyeing her panties? It's just great. It's so fucking... Again, That that's the whole fucking meta humor as well. Like, it literally knows what it's doing, and it's going to tell you what it's doing, and it's still going to be funny because you know damn well that it's going to be done very very hilariously i i just i just love it and the thing is all it's like we have to be very clear with the way that the show is portrayed too it's not meant to be like edgy fan service it's just it's a, it's a little pocket of everything right it's not just po- like just penny shots it's not just fan service it, there's a reason for why you have that however many actually i, I need to see how many seconds of that penny shot there was uh well uh, for, for for science i understand uh, your point that you're trying to make, but unfortunately, your point is moot because uh, there is a lot of fan service in the rest of the Monogatari series in general. Right, specifically in the Bake Monogatari season. Okay, you know, actually, no, there's still a fair amount. Actually, no, yeah, you know what? There's a lot. There's a lot, but there's a lot of everything too. So it kind of evens out. In the end. Oh no, it's fine. But it's just like I'm just saying that like fan service is an integral part of the Monogatari series. Okay, so we talked about like openings, talked about parts. Let's talk about like our favorite like should we rank the girls? Well, yeah, I think that's a good idea because in my opinion, your rankings may change over time, not only because there will be new additions, but also because based on storylines and stuff, your opinions of those characters might increase or decrease. So I think we should keep a running tally. So the problem with my choices, I guess, is because technically I know everything. So, but I can tell you for a fact that opinions of certain characters changed as I was watching the series. 
So I can't really tell you, at least in the Bakemonogatari part, where I rank them. So unfortunately, it's going to have to come to just you. Yeah. At the moment, I would say that at the bottom, and again, not really like a, a negative at all, I would have to say that um, Mayoi, the snail girl, I, I mean, like, she's or, cute. I, I'm writing this down. She's very cute and all that, but, like, uh, wholesome, fluffy story, eh, that's about it, really. I mean, to be honest, like, that, uh, her being lost in her snail arc and the whole point of True. Senju Gahara and Araragi taking her home. Yeah, it, it, she's, it, her story is, like, she is an only child and her parents are divorced, right? And th- that's why, like, snail, she's, she's literally carrying her home on her. Like that's the reason why she like this the the the, the backpack that she has is supposed to, actually that's another thing too the backpack is representing the, the the shell of a snail just like how the stapler is the claw of the crab for Sinchikahara and so on. So with a Mayoi in particular, uh, the fact that her home is technically her snail's shell, which in this case is her backpack, because she actually doesn't belong anywhere. That's the whole point. Because in the end of that, because we're spoiling stuff, when she does find her quote-unquote home, the home has been demolished. But then she still managed to find peace of mind. And that's the point. It's also interesting in terms of that arc of two other things. The first thing is Senju Gahara and Aragi at the end of the snail arc officially gets together. And that's extremely important going forward, obviously, because it's their primary love relationship. The other thing that's extremely important is you, as the viewer, thought that Senju Gahara can see the snail, Mayoi. It wasn't until, I think, one of the episodes that at the end she says, like, oh, I don't see shit. What are you talking about? I'm just following you because I'm just following you. I will also say that the relationship between Araragi and Mayoi is um, interesting. Yeah, uh, this is you have now uh, touched upon one of the most controversial parts of the Monogatari series. So I think that at this point, there's not much to say because there would be a moment that is very obvious to you as a viewer that then we'll have to touch on this subject very in depth. Number Moving f- on to the, number four. Yeah, I would say, I would say, Suruga the monkey, Kambaru. Yeah, Kambaru. Again, it was a good story. I just preferred the other three girls. For me, uh, I really like Kambaru as a character. The fact that she just runs around all the time. The fact that she is extremely perverted, like extremely perverted, like. And that's what leads me into the character that like number three okay hold, hold yeah, on yeah, yeah. i will say that like the revelation that kambaru is a lesbian was pretty funny because basically like i think aragi and, uh, and kambaru was in her room and then aragi said something like oh why are you trying to get together or blah 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 or like do something and then kambaru just super casually is like oh no uh, that's right because she's naked and aragi's like dude put on some clothes like what the fuck are you doing and then Kambaru was like, no, 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 it's it's all good. And he's like, no, 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 it's not good with me. And he, and she's like, it's all fine. I'm I'm a lesbian. And literally, there's like an eight second pause, and and Aragi's face is like a cartoon. You do appreciate how blunt um, Kambaru is. And then after that arc gets resolved, Senju Kahara is like, which happens apparently off screen was, oh yeah, Kambaru is now Aragi's errand girl or errand boy or whatever you want to call it. It's hilarious to me. And like every every single time as well, like whenever she's like, oh, Araragi or Koyomi or Nitan, like she knows that like this is the stuff that straight guys likes, but she doesn't care about, stra- about straight men because she's a lesbian herself, but she's just doing it as like a tease. She's, I, I like that part about her. But that also because of the dynamic between her, between Kambaru and uh, Araragi, which makes me really, really like Nadako. Snake Girl is now number three. Because she's quiet and timid, but also, like, she's... Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting that, for that, you to that, say that it. That I'm one waiting. specific scene uh, where both of them are... The, the, ex, the exorcist scene, kind of, right? Yeah. Hey, guys. do you, uh, Hey, Will. Do you like uh, tentacle porn? Yeah, no. 
But I, I mean, if Bucky Monogatari does it, I like it. I guess <laughs> it's oh god. Okay. To be fair, when I say tentacle porn, uh, there's not actually anything. There's nothing por- explicit. Okay? There's nothing pornographic in Bakken Monogatari or any of the Monogatari series. It's just very racy and very right? suggestive. Extremely, extremely suggestive. Right, but I did like her arc a lot, just because I, I liked the I liked the whole. I mean, to be fair, the whole story is about like about like curses and supernatural shit. But like the snake curse itself, I really like that story. And not to mention as well, it's also kind of haunted. It's, it's really hard not to like characters that she voices. Now, when it comes to the top two, I think it's basically like at this moment. I'm just, I'm just gonna write crab for number two, okay? Yeah. There we go. Dude, I love Senjigahara. I do, but there's just something about girls with braided pigtails side on the side of her head, glasses, and hey, man, mm-hmm. like if she got big tits and panty shots all the time, like <laughs> what? She literally says, literally when she turns back into her cat form, you just spit take. <laughs> I just spill water on my face and on the ground. <laughs> Okay. Give me a moment. Yeah. Oh, so this goes back into it's the just whole. Water, so it's yeah, fine, it's fine. Right? Yeah, this goes back to the whole meta humor of of Monogatari, where um, it might as well just go into it anyway. Hanakawa is very mysterious and is always like very suggestive with certain things. She sounds like very direct with Araragi. It's like, oh, I've always kind of liked you, and it's always like those moments where she comes in for a kiss, and then it's. Just, ends the episode and then the last couple episodes we start learning more about what happened in the past and how a force within her is reawakened and it turns out that you know this is the this is i think a part that we'll watch later on that i'll watch later on which is um neko black right is that is that well, we'll talk about that later on when I do actually start watching it. So, like when when she turns into her cat form, her human cat form, and she talks about, oh yeah, my mistress, like of course, like she's got big tits and she's always racy and horny and shit, right? Like you definitely want to fuck her, right? And then the like, Aragi's like, um, uh, I don't know what to say. Like I know there's an answer for this, but I don't want to say it lest I get in trouble or things get worse from now on. So another thing about uh the cat because the cat is in a way hanakawa and also in a way not hanakawa it's kind of like split personality the other thing that i really don't like about uh the hanakawa cat that uh unfortunately is going to be there for the rest of the series is that she uses the cat sound nya and a N Y A A that's why when she, that is that part where it's like can you say this phrase it was nya 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 is like I don't like cat girls, but I'm here for the moment. No, no, okay. That moment was actually done very well because they're very, like, they're very aware of that, like, fetish. And they're very aware that, okay, let's just, like, give it to you. No problem. And uh, that's just Nishio being very self-aware of just cultural stuff and just his reader base in general. Now, um, yeah, I think her backstory uh we're talking about hanakawa here is uh i mean it's it's very unfortunate and uh it really highlights the fact that she wears a mask and i think one of the most heartbreaking moments is i think occurs towards the end of bakemonogatari where um let's just say emotions from the Hanakawa perspective, becomes very raw and real. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Where she breaks down, and that was that and was it, tough. And, and the part was well, where it was all silent, but you don't need to hear anything. And in fact, the fact that they made it silence just makes it more prominent. Really, you don't ever really. I mean, unless someone is like in actual like physical pain or torment, like you don't really see anyone break down. People tend to be relatively strong throughout the Bakemonogatari series, but seeing like moments of weakness, it's like, damn, this person is really down in the dumps. This person is really struggling and need help. And that was like very, very accentuated by like that literal like three, four seconds of seeing Hanakawa cry. It was that was actually really rough. Yeah, I, it was. It's really unfortunate. 
also what's really in, i mean it's just water it'll dry out right yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, jason's been crying because of rethinking of the hanukkah scene yeah with water yeah it's from just, his mouth he's crying from his mouth yeah uh, that sounds really gross. Will. Yeah, <laughs> super gross. Will dude. Okay, there's there's just a lot to love about Bakemonogatari. So it's 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 funny, it's extremely comedic, it's artistic, it's beautiful, it's very. There's a lot of horn dog moments for sure, and I'm there for it. I mean, I mean, why not? Right? I'm a straight man. I can I can get down with that shit. Or if you're you know if you just find any enjoyment, any of the panty shots and the the boot physics and all that. Hey, there's lots of that in this season. And also just it, it's all counterbalanced by all the the darker and extremely emotional undertones. Like cause you just know that even when the like, two characters are professing their love, you know some shit is happening in the background and you just know that in the next episode that shit comes to the forefront and then after that when you find out more about that, it'll lead on to future episodes, future seasons, I hope. So, will the next entry in the novel release order is Kizu Monogatari, which, from the anime adaptation perspective, is a trilogy of movies. Do you know actually anything about Kizu Monogatari? Is, is it going to focus on Shinobu? Yes. Right. In fact, if um, it's the... You know, it's spoiler, so I can tell you. If you remember the first couple of minutes of the first episode, there's like all these quick flashes of certain yeah, yeah, events yeah. that doesn't seem to make sense. That is essentially Kizu Monogatari and the major events that happen in Kizu Monogatari. Cool. So then you will actually know why Shinobu, for example, is the way that she is. You will know why uh, Araragi seems to have certain powers or sorts. It's, it's, uh, it pieces in Hanakawa's relationship. Yeah, you, I mean, the, the, definitely the flashbacks like help you at least get an idea of what to expect uh, when you get into Kizu Monogatari, though, of course, I feel bad for all the fans that had to wait seven years yeah. for that movie to come I'm out. I'm so glad that I watched it in the past couple of years when everything was out so that I was able to just watch it at my leisure. All right. So the show itself, is, it's wonderful. What would you give it, it out of 10? I give it a 9. Uh, that's what I gave. Because uh, it, it does everything very well. There's a good amount of romance, wholesomeness, horniness edginess violence and overall just very very well put together like mysterious drama i i thoroughly enjoyed it all the way through of course there are going to be moments for anybody who's watching it and who has watched it probably feels the same way it can be pretty heavy to watch but once you get past the obstacle the rest of the way you you just get consumed by it and it's just a very wonderful time last thing did you end up pausing and reading the screens no i didn't i had to rush watching all of it because otherwise i wouldn't have been able to make it for the recording that but, is extremely fair yeah but i i know that like parts of it are like literally like sections of the light novel right yes and uh they calm down that aspect not the the flashes but in terms of the dialogue such that even though and they also don't make it that fast so then now you're able to uh, actually read it at a non-pause level, basically. Uh, they realize their mistake in this sense. So, I mean, if you've made it this far in terms of the spoiler discussion, you probably already have, already have watched it. Or if you haven't, okay, we definitely didn't spoil that much. So go ahead and watch it. It's really fucking good. All right. Um, to be honest, for the spoilery section for JoJo Part 1, I don't really have that much to spoil or discuss, really. More than we just let's just bask in the ridiculousness that is Judge's Bizarre Adventure. Okay, so holy or, shit! Like I completely agree. It's a really fucking dumb anime, but God, it's so good. Uh, the the non spoiler section. I mentioned uh, a name change, Luck and Pluck. That's fucking dumb, bro. Yep. <laughs> and I had to Google it. Like, I thought pluck is like, you know, you pluck your feathers. But then apparently an old definition of pluck is courage. Mm. So I'm like, oh. And then when I read the kanji, I was like, oh. But for a moment, I was just like, this is, the fuck is this? What do you think of, uh, okay, so just like how watching the overall Bakamonogatari season, it's essentially one guy with his little pseudo harem. It's not really a full harem, but like he's very close with all the main characters. Jojo is the inverse where it's just a lot of dudes. 
a lot of big burly men. And that's fine. And only but... one one woman. Yes. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that. How do I say this? A lot of the things that I associate with JoJo, at least through osmosis and from other people, for example, the metrosexual flamboyant nature is not present in that much. I mean, Dio does do certain poses and has that aura. But other than that, I don't really feel that there is that kind of feel. Of course, also, the other very prominent thing, and since we're in spoilers, I will say it, the thing that a lot of people associate with JoJo is stand. And there's none of that in part one at all. So far, it's just Hamon. And that breathing. is so, it's so Demon Slayer. Like, bro, how? Who copied who, right? Except who copied that, who? Except, except that JoJo one... came out in 1987 and Demon Slayer came out in the mid 2010s. Look, I mean, breathing. They do their own thing. They do I, mean, their own thing. I, I mean, breathing and chi and all that stuff is already heavily ingrained in. Uh, uh, was it Shin Shintoism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 or just, even the, uh, just any elements of like spirituality, right? Being Asian able to, spirituality, yeah, being yes. able to maintain breathing to find your inner peace, yes, and balance and harmony, yes. Your chakras and all that Naruto shit, <laughs> Nine Tails shit, yeah. yeah. But okay, in terms of like how ridiculous the show is, like there's a lot of really fucking dumb moments. There's right? so many dumb moments. What are you talking about? Do you remember what happened in the beginning of uh, JoJo uh, when Dio and Jonathan are no, uh, Joseph? No, no, John, John, Jonathan. Jonathan, yeah, Jonathan are are playing, and then afterwards like, they're playing rugby. First of all, and mm-hmm. then and then afterwards there's like a scene that um, goes on afterwards. Do you remember what happened to the dog? Yeah, the dog dies. How? Uh, robbery. No, it was said to – the father said to Jonathan that, oh, there was a robbery and your dog died. But really what it was is Dio just fucking hates that dog. And because that dog and Jonathan, like, really have a affectionate relationship with one another, he's like, I'm just going to kill it to take revenge. Is, is that what it is, Will? Yeah. Fucking throws in a fire and burns it alive. Yep. So fucked up. And I know it's very early on, but what do you make of Dio Brando so far as, like, the villain within JoJo, or at least a villain in the grand scheme of anime? So, I think the fact that the manga was made in the 1980s, specifically 1987, is extremely indicative of everything in terms of part one. I think if you were to look at part one the first nine episodes as a modern anime i think it is okay but not really that great also because dio brando despite the memes so if you exclude all the memes and everything is an extremely one-dimensional 1980s cheesy villain there is no redeeming qualities about him there's no other com- than he's just pure evil. Yeah, there's no complexity. I mean, there is a little bit of backstory, but it's very, very minor and very, very simple. Uh, he doesn't. There is no. He has. A, he's not two faced. He's just literally that one face, and that face is evil, and that's it. Uh, comically evil, even I would say. But when you factor in the fact that it's the 1980s, when you factor in the memes, Dio Brando becomes way more unforgettable whereas jonathan joe star is the polar opposite i think he obviously he's extremely important because as the joe stars i'm assuming that all the other parts is about his lineage but i think him as a character jonathan joe star is so whatever basic yeah he is he is in my books i mean i it's not spoilers anyway because you just finished watching the first part I would consider him personally like the weakest JoJo. Oh, okay. I would also even say that Erina, which is the wife of Jonathan, yeah, Erina and the, Pendleton, yeah, and the mother of. Wait, can I say that? Yeah, the mother of Joseph, Joestar, which is the person that would be featured in part two. At least I know that for sure. Even her as a character is more interesting than Jonathan. Like Jonathan's 
Jonathan Joestar's only redeeming quality in my eyes is that he's the protagonist, so therefore he gets a pass. He essentially starts the the, the whole oh, yeah, JoJo the JoJo bloodline. That too as well. So like there is that level of importance, but it, once like, you start developing the story, once you start going into the other parts, you you tend to forget about Jonathan. He's very forgettable, like super forgettable. Uh, it, it, just as much as you say that Dio Brando is very one dimensional, I felt the same thing about Jonathan. Or actually, not dimensional. He's just he's just there. He's just a big burly man who learns about the way of breathing and uses ripple energy to defeat his enemies, and then that's it. And never gives up, and is a gentleman or whatever. But for me, Dio is way more interesting, despite my criticisms of him. And even if you exclude the memes, at least like he he's just so evil to the core. You know, so I'm interested to see where this goes. I think the fact that the stands have yet to make an appearance, and I'm pretty sure it's coming at part two. I'm almost 100% sure it comes at part two. Yeah. So the thing is with this discussion about JoJo part one, it is going to be shorter than the Bakamonogatari overview simply because it's shorter. It's nine episodes, and it's literally just laying out the precursor of what to expect throughout the rest of JoJo, right? So, like, I think with Bakemonogatari, 15 episodes, it's one of the, the longer um, parts, like, sections, because some of them are, like, 12 episodes, some of them are six, and then there's, like, one which is, like, two seasons but split in half yeah, in or, terms of watch or, order. Yeah, or Wari Monogatari. Yeah. Um, you're also talking uh, about Nisei Monogatari and the Monogatari second season. It's all worded very weirdly, but yes, you're correct. Yeah. Whereas with like JoJo, like once you get past part one, part two, 17 episodes, part three is four curves split into two, and then three cur and three cur for parts four and five. So yeah. I have a long road ahead of me, and I'm looking forward to it. But I think, uh, Will, uh, I'm not calling you out or anything, but I think for um, both of us, we would really need to thoroughly plan out how we're going to consume this and also how we're going to structure the spoilery and non-spoilery talk because I'm anticipating that our spoilery talk is only going to get longer and longer and our non-spoilery talk is only going to get shorter and shorter. Yeah. I think the thing, exactly like once once I start talking about I don't know Koyomi Monogatari or when you start talking about part part 4 at that point, it's already spoiler territory, right? Yeah, like, and if I can already talk this much about nine episodes, and if you could already talk this much about 15 episodes, imagine me talking about 40-something episodes worth of content. That's just crazy. Or for me, it's like three movies, and then afterwards, like another small season, and then afterwards, like I think it's like four episodes for Nico Black? Or, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. four episodes. That's still that's still a lot of content. I think like in the end, like the way that we will want to do this is rather than going like, oh, I'm covering all these series, and Jason's going to cover... All of part two, all of part three. We're going to break it down as a slow journey because the thing is, I don't want us to rush this. I, At least specifically for me, Monogatari is going to be a slow burn because if I rush through it, I feel like I will lose a lot of meaning in terms of what's on the screen. I mean, I watched it all in, all like in a span of three to four weeks, but I also gave myself a bit of a break here and there. And... As long as the plot lines and the characters are fresh in your mind, there is no reason why you are not allowed to take it slow. And I think with JoJo as well, in fact, the things that you said is exactly the same thing that I would apply to JoJo. I just want to take my time and enjoy this series that is supposed to be one of the best series of all time. And for you, also one of the best series of all time as well. So yeah. So to essentially, like, yeah, the reason why you want to do it is not just because of the fact that it's long running, but it's also extremely popular like both jojo and monogatari are like in the top 100 for overall popularity for anime and manga series and i think that as an anime or manga fan you have definitely heard of monogatari series you have definitely heard of jojo and maybe you feel like this is a beast that is cannot be conquered because there's just so much wealth uh, so much brev brevity in there i mean when we talk about like best girl or waifu tier lists there's always going to be Monogatari characters. When we talk about memes and popular culture, there's always going to be a JoJo reference somewhere. So I feel that if you could be convinced to join us on this journey, whether it is just JoJo or the Monogatari series or even both, we want it so that you can watch this series over a long period of time. Or if you are a new listener from 
all the way in the future, you can listen back and see the progression that we will take. I can imagine, like, if you ever want to talk to us about, you know, specific arcs within the Monogatari series or specific character directions within JoJo, like, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about it because, bro, there is a lot of depth in Monogatari. There's a lot of shit to talk about in JoJo. And it's I'm, I'm very excited for how the rest of the series pans out. Yeah, I think we just have to plan it. Uh, we have to adapt, basically, to the things that we will consume, Will. All right. Anything else, Will, before I go into housekeeping? Bucky Monogatari is amazing. I'm, to, I'm glad to that be I honest, managed to give it a second chance. To be honest, JoJo Part 1, I wouldn't say is that amazing, but I can see glimpses of it being amazing, like genuinely. And I am also glad that third time's the charm for me. So I'm glad that I finished Part 1, and I'm actually extremely invested from this point onwards. I'm glad that third times the charm actually worked for you this time because third times the charm for Ergo Proxy did not work. I know. I know. I know. I knew exactly what you're going to say. All right. So this is the end of our good anime palette episode 20. You can always reach us through our email, gapalette at gmail.com. That's G-A-P-A-L-E-T-T-E at gmail.com, all lowercase, all one word. You can also contact us on Twitter using the handle at Palette Good. That's capital P and capital G, all one word. We have a Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash Palette Good. That's capital P, capital G, all one word. Or though I don't know nowadays, is it called Meta, right? I don't know how that's going to work, but let's see how that works. Meta book. Meta book. Uh, we also have a website, and we encourage you to check it out. You can visit our website at www.goodanimatepalette.com, all lowercase, all one word. You can also join us on Discord. The invite link is in the show description. We also have a Mao Club. Uh, that invite link is also in the show description. If you uh, don't want to click on it and you just want to get the invite, you can just email us and we'll send it to you no problem. Music credits for this episode. Our intro music is Glitterati by Fox Morrow. Our break, mu- uh, our break music is Up and Down by Toby Tranter. And our outro music is Sunset Dew by Lupus Nocte. Our music was provided courtesy of EpidemicSound.com. If you're interested in using Epidemic Sound as a service, we have a referral link that is provided in the show description. All right. Will. So you know the thing we talked about earlier about giving Ergo Proxy uh, a third time to review and it still didn't work? At the time when we talked about it, it was holding a very pretty 8.00. No way. Okay, what is it now? It's now dropped down to a 7.91. What? It actually dropped a lot. And especially for a series that has already ended and from so long ago, that is crazy. I think, I don't know, man. I I never wish ill upon any series or any mangas, but it's very hard to convince me that there is something very deep about Urko Proxy without like me just telling you that it's pretty dense and dry. To be honest, like Ergo Proxy has ticks a lot of boxes for me. It is cyberpunk. Okay. I love cyberpunk. Uh it features a dystopian future slash utopia. Okay, that's a very common trope of science fiction. And then within like science fiction dystopias, it's also very philosophical too. Exactly. Right? I love all of that. Oh, it features like a badass woman because uh there you don't get a lot of that. I also agree with that statement. She is a very, very good main character. Uh, the use of robots. It's good. It's in, Or androids. I like it. But somehow it just doesn't work out. I don't know why. But I can say that for you, when Gatry series is working out very well. Extremely well. I'm f- pretty sure that soon after. Well, I mean, it's going to be a while before we do the next episode of Gotta Watch Them All. But I'm, I've really got... He's a Monogatari lined up in my watch list. And for me, Jojo, I'm I'm feeling great about it. I'm happy to see what comes next. Now the Jojo memes make even more sense now, right? I mean, when you put context in it, it kind of lessens <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> when you have to explain the joke, right? No, it's not just that. It's like, oh, this came f- – oh, the ED is actually the, the to-be-continued part. Oh, that kind of – I mean, it's good, but I kind of wish I never knew that. Yeah, see, for me, like it was different because like I always heard that song, but I never knew where it came from, and I never about to look for it. And then, like, but like, whenever I saw it in the memes, it was always like Western memes, not anime memes. So then, when I actually started watching JoJo, I was like, "Wait a minute!" It's the the song is called Roundabout, right? Yeah, it's very good. It's a classic. It's really, really good because it's funky. 
but like I can't help but look at it as a meme song. Anyways, thanks very much for listening to today's episode. We hope that you stay with us for this journey of Bo- uh, the Monogatari series as well as JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It's going to be a very long adventure. I think both of them have their own Bizarre Adventures. Yeah. So stay tuned for the next episodes. We will go back into our regular thematic topic episodes um, for I think in two weeks' time. Yeah, but, but rest yeah. assured, the story of JoJo and the story of the Monogatari series is not over. Dude, far from. I think like overall we have over a like, hundred episodes worth of stuff. Jesus Christ. All right. See you guys. Peace. Oh, 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 oh,